children, and welcome to the last reading from the tales of Beedle the Bard. This tale, a tale of woe and misery, a tale that will shake you to your wand. This will be the last tale read by Yaniel of Gryffindor House. Be afraid. Be scared, young ones, for this is the most gruesome of all Bard's tales. And without further ado, Yaniel of Gryffindor House. Hello. It has been several months since we have gotten together for a reading. I'm not supposed to read the last tale. For it is dark. The darkest of all the Bard's tales. But tonight, on All Hallows' Eve, we will dive right in. Now everybody hold on to your wands and be prepared. Though I think we must shed some light on this situation. Are we ready, children? Lumos. Ha ha. Much better. Welcome back to the studio. And now I give you the warlock's hairy heart. There was once a handsome, rich, and talented young warlock who observed that his friends grew foolish when they fell in love. Gambling and, and preening, losing their appetites and their dignity. The young warlock resolved never to fall prey to such weakness and employed the dark arts to ensure his immunity. Unaware of that secret, the, family his, the warlock's family laughed to see him so aloof and cold. All will change, they prophesied, when a maid catches his fancy. But the young warlock's fancy remained untouched, though many a maiden was intrigued by this, his haughty mien and employed her most subtle arts to please him. None succeeded in touching his heart. The warlock gloried in his indifference and the sagacity that had produced it. The first freshness of youth waned and the warlock's peers began to wed and then to bring forth children. <laughs> Their hearts must be husks, he sneered inwardly as he observed the antics of the young parents around him, shriveled by the demands of their mewling offspring. And once again, he congratulated himself on the wisdom of his early choice. In due course, the warlock's aged parents died. Their son did not mourn them. On the contrary, he considered himself blessed by their demise. Now he reigned alone in their castle, having transferred his greatest treasure to the deepest dungeon he gave himself over to a life of ease and plenty. His comfort, the only aim of his many servants. The warlock was sure that he must be an object of immense envy to all who beheld his splendid and simply untroubled solitude. Fierce were his anger and chagrin, however when he overheard two of his lackeys discussing their master one day. The first servant expressed pity for the warlock who with all his wealth and power was yet beloved by nobody. But his companion jeered, asking why a man with so much gold and a palatial castle to his name had been unable to attract a wife. Now these words dealt dreadful blows to the listening warlock's pride. He resolved at once to take a wife and that she would be a wife superior to all others. She would possess astounding beauty 
exciting envy and desire to every man who beheld her. She would spring from magical lineage so that their offspring would inherit outstanding magical gifts. She would have wealth at least equal to his own so that his comfortable existence would be assured in spite of an addition to the household. It might have taken the warlock 50 years to find such a woman, yet it so happened that the very day he decided to seek her, a maiden answering his every wish arrived in the neighborhood to visit her kinsfolk. She was a witch of prodigious skill and possessed much gold. She was, her beauty was such that it tugged at the heart of every man who set eyes on her. Every man, of course, except one. The warlock's heart felt nothing at all. Nevertheless, she was the price he sought, so he began to pay her court. All who noticed the warlock's changed in manners were amazed, and she told the maiden that she had succeeded where a hundred had failed. The young woman herself was, was both fascinated and repelled by the warlock's intentions. She sensed the coldness that lay behind the warmth of his flattery, and had never met a man so strange and remote. Her kinsfolk, however, deemed theirs a most suitable match, and eager to promote it, accepted the warlock's invitation to a great feast in that maid's honor. The table was laden with silver and gold, bearing the finest wise wines and most sumptuous foods. Mistrels strummed on silk-streamed lutes and sang of a love their master had never felt. The maiden sat upon a throne beside the warlock, who spake low, employing words of tenderness he had stolen from the poets, without any idea of their true meaning. The maiden listened, puzzled, and finally replied, You speak well, warlock, and I would be delighted by your attentions, if only I thought you had a heart. The warlock smiled and told her she need not fear on that score. Bidding her follow, he led them from the feast down to the locked dungeon where he kept his greatest treasure. Here, in an enchanted crystal casket, was the warlock's beating heart. <sighs> Long since disconnected from eyes, ears, and fingers, it had never fallen prey to beauty or to a musical voice, to feel or to the feel of silken skin. The maiden was terrified by the sight of it, for the heart was shrunken and covered in long black hair. Oh, what have you done? She lamented. Put it back where it belongs, I beseech you. Seeing that this was necessary to please her, the warlock drew his wand, unlocked the crystal casket, sliced open his own breast, and replaced the hairy heart in the empty cavity it had once occupied. Now you are healed and will know true love, cried the maiden and embraced him. The touch of her soft white arms, the sound of her breath in his ear, the scent of her heavy golden hair, all pierced the newly awakened heart like spears. But it had grown strange during this long exile, blind and savage into the darkness to which it had been condemned, and its appetites had grown powerful and perverse. 
The guest at the feast had noticed the absence of their host and maiden. At first, untroubled, they grew anxious as the hours passed and finally began to search the castle. They found the dungeon at last and a most dreadful sight awaited them there. The maiden lay dead upon the floor, her breast cut open, and beside her crouched the mad warlock, holding one in one bloody hand a great, smooth, shining, scarlet heart, which he licked and stroked, vowing to exchange it for his own. In his other hand, he held his wand, trying to coax from his own chest the shriveled, hairy heart. But the hairy heart was stronger than he was and refused to relinquish his hold upon his senses or to return to the coffin in which it had been locked for so long. Before the horror-struck eyes of the guest, the warlock cast aside his wand and seized a silver dagger Vowing never to be mastered by his own heart, he hacked it from his chest. For one moment, the warlock knelt triumphant, with a heart cr clutched in each hand. Then he fell across his maiden's body and died. And there I give you the trouble of the warlock's hairy heart. Remember, a heart is too precious to be cast aside. It is what makes us all that we are and connects us to the feelings and emotions, the senses, and what makes life beautiful. Now, I wish everyone a happy Halloween, and please remember, if you liked this tale, check out the others as well. I have read ha Babity, Rabbity Babity, and The Cackling Stump. I have read The F Fair Fountain, and I have read The Tale of the Three Brothers. This concludes the series of The Beetle and the bard, sorry, Beetle the bard. But there are many great tales to come. If you liked and enjoy, please let me know. Subscribe, like, and share. And if you have any requests for future tales, let me know, and I will do my best to fulfill those. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Bye-bye.